Good evening and a very warm welcome to everyone here. I am Malika Varma. Welcome you all to yet another Authors Afternoon, a very treasured initiative of Prabha Khetan Foundation. An afternoon dedicated to an enchanting conversation circling around the life and works of a distinguished author and a conversationalist. An exclusive literary soiree solely dedicated for the love of literature and by the lovers of literature from the city of joy, Kolkata. It is a proud privilege for us to continue in our journey of literary activities and events in the city. Today's event held by Pradha Kherdan Foundation in association with Taj Bengal enjoys the support of SR's Women of Kolkata and patron Shri Cement Limited as their CSR project. Our media partner for today is My Kolkata. Today we are particularly honoured to have an Emmy-winning journalist and an eminent author, Richara Gupta, grace today's author's afternoon with her presence. Our conversationalist for today will be the writer, editor and translator, none other than our Anjum Kathyal. May I request Mr. Miyotia to please say a few words and introduce Ruchira to us. So, friends, uh, what do I say about Ruchira? First of all, she is... Uh, my, my association with her, friendship with her, relationship with her is really inherited. It's not my fault that I know her. Uh, it happens to be that my our parents knew each other. And so literally since she was born, because I was born a few years earlier, I have known her. Now, for most of my life, it seemed to be terrible luck that I seemed to have run into to come to know her because she was a very close friend of my sister. They studied together. And the one telephone that we used to have at home, a landline, was most often occupied between she on one end and my sister on the other, leaving me very little time to talk to my friends. So <laughs> that started a very healthy enmity between her and me through my sister, whom obviously, as you know, most brothers bully their sisters. So I continued that tradition with her. And we, whenever I saw at home, I used to snarl at her, <laughs> growl at her. And she would, she being the fighter that she is, which you'll discover from this book, used to snap back. My sister was a little polite and nice <laughs> and saying, But she would be like really, really sort of a real fighter. So we spent a good part of our childhood fighting and I never thought I would ever get to admire her. <laughs> but as time went on, this uh, fighting young lady turned out to become this amazing woman who has changed so many lives in so many wonderful ways. Uh, not just as an author, but as an activist, as someone who's deeply involved with very important social causes that someone whom I thought I'd written off as one mad woman who's completely cracked, <laughs> naughty, and completely, uh, you know, sort of lost it kind of thing, uh, turned out to be someone who uh, made us all feel very, very proud. So to my dear sister, mm -hmm. whom I now deeply admire, I used to love her then also, but fine with her. <laughs> but uh, now I feel really proud. I, Really delighted that she's here with us back in Calcutta. She lives in the US, uh, but her home is Calcutta. Her soul is in Calcutta, even though her body is mostly out of it. So, <laughs> warm welcome to you. And Anjum Didi, warm welcome to you. Thank you very much for doing this conversation. My pleasure. Thank you. Words uh, from Mr. Nyotia, which I think eventually I hope to be able to speak like him in my lifetime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we all know what Ruchira's accomplishments are, but I will take a minute to just run through this because 
it is really worth listening to and worth reading if you will allow me that time. Ruchira Gupta is an Emmy-winning journalist and founder of the anti-sex trafficking NGO Apnea that empowers women and girls to exit systems of prostitution. She has been awarded the French Audre National Demerit, sorry, I don't know whether I'm reading that right. You can correct me. The Clinton Global Citizen Award and the UN NGO CSW Women of, Women of Distinction among other honors for her contribution to the establishment of the UN Trafficking Fund for Survivors. The US Trafficking Victims Protection Act and her grassroots activism with Apnea. She also holds a Doctor of Humane Letters degree from Smith College. Ruchira has worked for the United Nations in Nepal, Thailand, Kosovo, Iran, and the US. She occasionally teaches at the New York University Center for Global Affairs as a visiting faculty. Ruchira divides her time between New York and Forbes Gunj, her childhood home in the foothills of the Himalayas, where she furthers the work of Apneha and paints her mother's garden. I'm very privileged that my girls worked with her and learned so much with her in Kolkata. So, and New York. And New York, yes. <laughs> thank you for reminding me. So she made a huge, huge mark on them. Anjum needs no introduction. We love her. We love you too, Richard, but she lives with us. Anjum Katyal is a writer, editor, and translator. She has been chief editor, Seagull Books, as well as editor, Seagull Theatre Quarterly, Calcutta, web editor, Saregama HMB, and editor, Art and the City. She is the author of several books on theatre and performance and a translator. She is currently director APJ Kolkata Literary Festival and curator Nomano Earth Weekend Shanti Niketan, a festival of arts and ideas, as well as editor Art Art and Arts Journal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for both being here. Um, both Calcuttans, we are very honored to have you both. Over to you, may I please request you to keep your phones on silent or switched off, whatever you please. Thank you so much. Um, very warm series of introductions. Richira, it was almost, uh, it was most moving to hear um, her, her talking. Well, he called me Didi, so I don't know what I should call him now. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, talking about uh, your growing up years, and I could just see that little girl who was refusing to take any kind of bullying lying down and constantly uh, deciding to hit back. And that quality clearly didn't uh, fade away as we grew older. And um, so one of the things that um, I was telling Ruchira just before we walked in here that I've known her now for many, many years and in many different uh, phases of her life. First, I was going to say that in some way she reinvents herself as much as her uh, protagonist does in the book. But then I thought, no, actually, it's not a question of reinvention. It's more a question of pushing boundaries. So every time I meet her, there's something new that she's decided to explore and develop. And uh, so what started with the uh, journalism, I'm sure many of you know that she was a very, very um, involved and active journalist. She was one of the journalists who was there uh, in 92 when the Babri Masjid was um, was broken down. And so she's had that trajectory of a very, you know, sort of pasty and on the ground active journalist, not just a desk job. And then she's gone into working with uh, setting up her own NGO, an anti-trafficking one, started thinking about what happens to the girl child, the concept of the last girl. I remember Ruchira sharing that with me. And then become an academic, she teaches, and she could now become a writer, she writes. So there are all these, it's like accretions and accumulations that have happened over the year, each thing leading to a new yeah. discovery. And one of the nicest surprises for me was to see her in her avatar as a writer of fiction. So, which is a whole different ballgame, because uh, it is, when you're a journalist, you are writing a certain kind of very, very readable prose for sure. But it's a certain a prose which is basically communicating information. And here in this book, she inhabits the soul and the heart of a young girl in a very um, 
uh, very uh, uh, sort of uh, certainly for me very surprising way as I was reading it and I kept thinking wow how did she get under the skin of her character in quite this way so I'd like to her to actually start with reading something because that's when you'll see immediately what I'm talking about Thank you, Anjum. Um, I will read an extract, uh, which is a conversation between my 14-year-old protagonist, Hira, and her cousin sister, Meeradi. Meeradi has been sold into the flesh trade, and my protagonist has just been expelled from school for stealing an egg. And uh, Meeradi really wants her younger cousin to get back into school because she knows that perhaps school might be the way to be saved from sex trafficking. And Hira feels that she's bullied, she's expelled. Her younger sister, Chotu, who was just three years old, has just died uh, from fever because the room was leaking. And so this is just an extract of this conversation. What if everyone in Girls Bazaar, Chacha and Baba are right? Did Chotu die because of me? What if I did bring bad luck to the family? I voice my doubts aloud. This grabs Miradi's attention. Since when did you begin to believe in the superstitious nonsense? I don't meet her eye, focusing instead on Jamila Bua as she fries the onion pakoras for the lunchtime rush. A black crow drives a sparrow away from the garbage. It's a stark reminder that the mightiest will survive, that destiny decides who will be mighty. It's the way of the world, Miradi. If destiny hasn't decided where I was born, who has? It's all a birth lottery, I say bitterly, walking up and down inside the small space of our hut. Miradi comes and hugs me. She strokes my head. I know you feel frustrated, but do you have a choice? What else can you do if you don't go back to school? I steer the conversation away from destiny. In my heart, I know that I don't believe the superstitions, but all the women in our lane believe in the eternal, inescapable fate of our nomadic nut tribe because they can't imagine anything beyond it. There was no defiant mother or cousin or teacher or sister to fight for them. I decide to spell out my other fear. What if I don't understand anything in class? There, I've said it. I don't want to be the stupidest kid in the class anymore, especially knowing what the boys will do to me. Miradi looks at me with no expression on her face. Then her brow furrows into a small fold. As far as I remember, you did fine in school, at least when you were a kid. You used to get the highest scores for reading aloud in both Hindi and English. You used to be so fond of books. I could not tear you away from the school library. Miradi smiles at the memory. I smile back. I used to love the dusty library, the smell of books and the stories I read in the privacy of the desk between the shelves by the window. Tagore, Shari Chandra, Mahadevi Verma and the adventure stories by the English writers Enid Blyton and Laura Lee Ho. Words have always come easily to me. Then came the hunger, the bullying, the chores at home, my first menstruation. Everything slipped away. That was because you and Salman would help me when I got stuck. I mumbled, my head down. Then ask Salman to help you now. He's your older brother, Miradi suggests. Oh, he's always so busy with his studies, I mutter. Can't you help me? Do you think I remember anything after the hell I've lived through these past few years? There's an aggressive edge to Miradi's voice. I see a small, worn spark of hope fight the fear in her eyes. She wants to convince me to go to school against all the odds I must face. Under her clumsy makeup is a desperate appeal. I look at her and remember her full-throated and happy laugh as a girl. I resolve to rekindle the laughter, light and hope in her eyes. I will overcome my fears for her. I will fight for my future for the dreams that she could never make come true for herself. Outside, the sky is grey, the sun sending out weak rays through the mist. Far off, a train whistle blows. I give Miradi's hand a squeeze. 
I promise I will go and meet Rini Di, the teacher who says she'll get me back into school. I want to anyway. Meera Di finally smiles again. She gets up to go. She can't stay too long in case Chacha or Shokat start looking for her as soon as a new client appears. I'll send word to Rini Di that you will go to her tomorrow, she says as she ties a scarf around her head. Her body language changes. She stiffens, drawing in her shoulders as she walks away. Selfishly, perhaps, I realize that I'm not doing this just for her. I want to be a person. I want to kick and fly. I want to win. I want to have the courage, like Rini Di, to demand a life without fear. Make off Zindagi. So, Ruchira, I know that you've been working and also in the Forbes Gandhi area where this book is set uh, for many years. And obviously your work would have brought you very close to these communities and your struggle to get the girls to break out of this vicious cycle. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, this nut community that you uh, dis uh, uh, have set the book amidst? And also a little bit about what drove you to write a work of fiction based on that? So the nuts are a nomadic group. And uh, normally in the past, they would migrate from the forests where they lived in to the plains with their goat and sheep and sell the dairy products uh, that they had, meat and uh, cheese and milk, etc. Plus, they would also sell indigenous medicine that they made from forest produce uh, and snake venom. They also worked the helwans, so they could do wrestling acts and win championships out of that as well as being tightrope uh, walkers and acrobats and all of that. So as they were migrating from the hills to the plains, they would perform these things, live in common land in villages and also trade and do these acts. But what happened was in the British colonized India, they passed something called the Criminal Tribes Act. And under that, uh, 16 tribes uh, that were labeled, there were many tribes who were labeled as criminal tribes, but there were 16 tribes who were not just labeled as criminal tribes, but they were outlawed from wearing shoes, hats, riding on horses, uh, living uh, under pakka roofs. And they had to actually look for uh, land which they could even eke out an existence on. So they started squatting on government land or on Zamindari land. And in return, they had to do the most menial chores uh, for the people who owned the land. Um, you know, cleaning spittoons, uh, mixing opium, and also making their women sexually available. And slowly over the years, they forgot they could do anything else. And uh, they uh, got trapped in something which I call intergenerational prostitution. Intergenerational prostitution is prostitution that is passed down from mother to daughter and pimping from father to son. And the 16 tribes that I'm talking about, this fate was the fate of many tribes because all the produce that they were making and the trade they were doing, made in England had to replace that, right? So if you could make medicine, it was replaced by Glaxo. If you could make bridges if with Rome or whatever, it was replaced by the Scottish engineering firms. If you could have dairy products, it was replaced by Caventa, Caventas. And so, these 16 tribes, when they got trapped in intergenerational prostitution, they even lost the memory over a period of years that they could do anything else, that they were pehelwans, that they could make indigenous medicine, that they had the best dairy products. They forgot that. And even when India became independent, uh, you know, Nehru passed a law. He said, we can't have some, something like this, you know in independent India. So he personally took the initiative and got this law removed from the books. That's why it's called the Denotified Criminal Tribe Act. And uh, so, but the stigma and the discrimination stayed and the police continued to arrest the people from this community saying, oh, you must be pimps and prostitutes or thieves. And the same thing with the women, you know, they, anyone who wanted women would just go there and say, well, we know that's what you're capable of. So uh, when I began work against sex trafficking, 
I began in Bombay, but very soon I realized that many of the women in the beer bars and in the brothels were actually people from these tribes. And you just have to dig and find out about caste and then the relation of caste with oppression. And then as you dig, more layers of all this comes out. And uh, so I began to look for wherever such tribes were, where they were working. And to my horror, I found they were right in the village where I had grown up in between Calcutta and uh, this small town at the border of Nepal in Bihar. And uh, there was a nut community there, also squatters living along the railway tracks and uh, oppressed by the Zanindars uh, to the point that their land was called Kavaspur, Kha and Avas, that you can eat and live in return for doing all these chores. And uh, they were living in 72 shacks made of plastic sheets and bamboo strung together. And all these shacks were really brothels. So the front room was where the family would live and the back room was where the girl would be sold to customers. And this strip was called Lalti in Bazaar because they were, like in Calcutta it's known as Red Light District or Mumbai it's known as Red Light, but in Bihar it was Lalti, like lanterns. And right next to the Mela ground, where the, there's a traveling Mela which comes every year to Forbes Gunch, the place that I set my novel in. And that Mela is supposed to be where farmers come from Dehar and they are buying cattle, selling cattle and other produce. But slowly the distortions which happened was that along with the cattle, girls began to be sold in this Mela and off and off. And there are something called orchestra parties, which then go from Mela to Mela with strip, what we think of strippers on stage. That's what happens. And the men choose the girls and take them into some place behind the tent. And sometimes these girls are taken and sold to Mumbai and Delhi to the brothels again. And now, from Rajasthan all the way up to Dubai and further on also Europe. So when I found that this red light district existed in Fort Ganj in my own uh, sort of village, I thought I must do something about it. I can't just work in Mumbai because Mumbai has other NGOs also, but this place has none. And so we opened a community center in that red light district and began to work to educate the children of the prostituted women, thinking that if we can break the cycle of intergenerational prostitution, it was really hard and, uh, you know, the girls had no imagination. You know, they thought that their future is to be sold into prostitution. It was their duty to their family to be a resource in poverty. And they were groomed like that from the time they were born. In my book, I describe how rites and rituals have been created around it. So they were so married to a banana tree and then auctioned off to the highest bidder in the mela. So everything was ritualized, you know, to make it normal. And uh, the men were taught to be pimps and they had to work for upper caste gangs. And if they refused, then their head would be chopped off or their ears would be torn off and all. And I've seen it all. So when I opened a community classroom, not only were we attacked by the traffickers who said, who are you and why are you here? And they would stick out knives at us, attack our team members, heckle them, steal things from our offices. The administration would say, is community ke liye kuch nahi ho sakta, ruchi raji chhod I would say, Aapki idea, aapko main karungi. And, but the biggest challenge was that the mothers and the girls did not believe that they have a future. So they were doing badly, even if I could force them to go to school, they were doing badly there. And uh, in my community classroom, they would start heckling the teacher because many of them were dependent on drugs and alcohol, also, the kids themselves. So I was thinking, how am I going? And they were always hungry. So the first thing I realized was that, uh, one, the kids would always complain of stomach aches, you know, when I was trying to get them to pay attention in class. So I said, I'll so some go doctor ke paas le jayenge. I thought I'd show that they are liars, you know, there's no stomach ache. The doctor said they have no food. So then we started a midday meal program, you know, with eggs and other things in the community classroom. Then the kids did begin to increase and, you know, they came for the food, but they began to pay attention. But even then, they were doing very badly in school because they were first generation learners and everyone knew they came from the red light area. And school, they were bullied and teased by the kids and the teachers. And on top of that, if a kid really stayed on in our class, the traffickers would come and heckle us. And sometimes they would lock up our kids and all of that. So we started a hostel inside the school compound under Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, you know, Kasturba Gandhi Bhavika Vidyalaya. 
And then the traffickers would jump over walls to kidnap our kids and take them back and all. So I said, you know, I have to prepare the kids for something. Uh, because even if they are kidnapped, even if they are trafficked, they must learn to fight back. So I got a couple, a man and a woman, to start teaching the kids karate and kung fu in our community classroom at the hostel. And strangely enough, which I had not expected, within months the kids began to break burning tiles. And we started putting them into competitions and they won gold medals. And that's when I began to write this book. Because as soon as a kid won a gold medal, what happened was everything changed. The kid found self-confidence, so she thought she could do better at other things. The family which wanted to sell her, the father suddenly thought, oh, my daughter is capable of something beyond this destiny of being a nut girl. The kids in school obviously stopped bullying. The teachers began to respect. The townspeople who would tell me that now they were thinking, oh, these kids are bringing medals. And one of the reasons they did well in this was because they came from a family of Belvans. They were flexible, they were agile, they could walk on uh, tight ropes and all. I thought I must share the story with the world, you know, and it's a story based on truth of stories yeah. inside my interview, but of hope. Stories of hope and also what struck me when I was reading it was the absolute nitty gritty detail in which, uh, you know, when, when she was speaking, you could make out that there's actual lived experience. She's actually been there, stayed there, seen what's going on. And that is what comes through in the book and that really grounds it. So you can really feel little, little details which somebody from the outside would not even think of, you know, uh, little bits of sensitivity to what makes these young girls feel and, and <laughs> react the way they do. Like there's this, uh, the, the incident of the egg, which she just mentioned that they started giving them eggs. And this girl, Hira, who looks forward to school because she can eat. There's that one one little bit of food that she gets. The way Ruchira describes the reaction she has in her body when she smells food, when rice is being cooked, and when you know, and when that purse of simple food, you know, is being served, and when she starts eating, you know, that feeling, that physical bodily feeling. So these are things that you know many of us would not even think of. Uh, but they read in the book, which shows a degree of immersion and involvement and sensitivity to uh, obviously uh, very, very based on what actually goes on. So as she was talking about this evolution, about starting the school and then the hostel and then the Kung Fu training, that's all here. So it's almost like this is a composite story yeah. of um, of the of the real journey that this NGO took in this small place. Yeah. So I think that's a one very remarkable feature of the book. And another thing I wanted to ask you about, Chira, is that despite the the really sad, tragic harshness yeah. of their lives and the 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 you know the the sort of um, very barbaric kind of brutality which they inhabit on a daily basis, somehow you don't have black and white characters. Mm. You know, even the father who wants to sell his child to and, and is waiting for the next Mela to come to sell her. The father or even the boy who bullies her in class, Manish. Manish. You know, there's something. So can you tell us a little about that? How did you escape that very natural temptation to have villains and uh, heroes? Yeah. You know, Anjum, I, you know, you asked me why did I write this book as fiction? One of the reasons I wrote the book as fiction is because I wanted people to get into the hearts and minds of my characters. They are real flesh and blood people. Because very often when we think of red light district or even poor people, you know, we see them as just black and white people, you know. And um, I have lived and witnessed so much in over decades, three decades now of working in these communities, right? And they have laughter and they have hope and they have sorrow and they have complicated family relationships and they have friendships and they have courage and they have resilience mm -hmm. and all of it, you know, and uh, I wanted people to understand that. So I thought, you know, if I just write it as nonfiction, you know, it's data. But if I write it as fiction, then I can talk about Hira's feelings, I can talk about her father's feelings, I can talk about the class bully's feeling, right? And so 
For example, you know, all my life I've been told, oh, that those poor people, they sell their daughters, you know, and I've lived in so many cultures, you know, West and East and rich cultures and poor cultures. So, you know, it's always bothered me, like, you know, it's not so black and white, I you feel like telling them, you know, you can't just blame, of course, he has to be held accountable. And I never take that away from the book. He is held accountable and pinned down even by his own daughter. But um, I wanted to show what poverty can do to people, what caste can do to people, what colonialism can do to people, you know. How does someone get dehumanized? It's not that I wake up thinking I have no heart. But, you know, uh, how does that person discover that? And, uh, you know, I don't know if may, any of you have seen The Wizard of Oz, but, you know, they are going out looking for a heart, right? And eventually he says, it's within you, you know, or he's looking for courage and he says, it's within you. So the same thing. And then, of course, this is the city of Tagore, where every story Rabindranath Tagore writes is about transformation and how that we all as human beings have humanism within us. And it gets dehumanized because of circumstances, a chain of circumstances, and how we can discover our humanity again. So I wanted that to be there in the book, because I've seen it happen, actually. I've seen the humanity come back, some small, uh, you know, spark of something. And the very people who are fighting me are also secretly helping me. You know, I've seen all of that. In this, the father's arc of character is the deepest, I think, where he wants to sell his daughter, but then when Hira uh, wins a gold medal, something changes in him and he begins to believe that his caste, the girls of his caste, his daughter, can achieve something. And that flame sort of then becomes more and more. I don't want to give the plot away, but you will see what happens to the father and the conversation which Hira has with her father. Yeah. So, uh, so one of the things that we were also talking about was that uh, this um, sense of rootedness and what you were saying about the fact that these people are conditioned, the girls, the women, the men, to feel that this is all this is all we can hope mm. for. We are born into this and this is our destiny and why are you fighting it? And why do you feel you're better than everybody else? You know? So that is a huge trap which somehow you find um, a way. So was Hira based on a real person? Yeah. Hira is based on a real person. And then there are things added on to her which are from other girls. Because not only one girl won a gold medal in karate in Apnea, but many girls. And so far, then we stopped counting. We've educated more than 3,000 children who are from red light areas who finished school and college and they're still continuing and they have jobs, you know, as teachers and uh, nurses and police officers and chefs. One's married who went to the Seagull Publishing School, you know, and yeah. she's uh, now in uh, Fort Visganj as a teacher. So, um, you know, my arc has always been about a journey which is sustainable in community and not like some magic wand solution. It's not that you go into a five-star hotel and get a Mercedes car and a Prada bag. No, you become a seamstress in your community. You become a teacher in your community because that's where the solutions lie. And that's the arc which I heard from different people and put into Hira's character. Mm. Yeah. So do you, do you know a girl like Hira? I do know a girl like Hira. <laughs> Juhi was also a girl like Hira who okay. you've met. And she also won gold medals in yeah, karate. Yeah. And uh, there are others. Uh, there's Poonam, there's Resham, there's Nazni, there's so many. And have they all, have any of them read the book? Yes, they have. And Najmeen, in fact, when I was in Fort Biscanj last, she was reading the book to the next generation of karate students in the Apne Up community center. So that was quite a proud moment for me. Yeah. And it's coming out in Hindi and Bangla. That's what you told me. You said you were very happy that it was being translated yeah. into Hindi. So um, one of the things um, I wanted to ask you about, it was very intrigued. I've known Ruchira a long time. And one thing I did not think she was, was athletic. Uh, I mean, I say that with a lot of empathy. Because you're <laughs> that but uh, when I was reading this passage where this young girl, Hira, is allowed to join the Kung Fu class. 
and uh, it's the first time that she's actually experiencing um, the ability to to use her body as a kind of uh, <coughs> something that's not to be ashamed of or not to be hidden or not something that's always an issue or a problem or a victim because her body's always been the cause of suffering. And here she finds the ability to use, to feel her body as something that is actually beautiful or freeing. It's a beautiful passage. And I remember thinking when I was reading it, that how did Ruchira feel this? Mm. Because it's very um, detailed. Would you, do you think we can read that? Yeah, it's a fine. Do you remember that? It was when, okay. Then. Um, and while she's finding it, I'll quickly start talking so yes. you can get a little yes. understanding of the background of it. So, you know, when I was working in the red light areas, I used to think that, you know, I want these girls to like who they are. And they did, they were sort of, they were a self-hatred, you know, because they thought that they would be sold because of their bodies, right? So I used to take them swimming and all, and they would refuse to put on swimsuits. And they would say, nahi, nahi, hum nahi penning. And fear, shame and guilt ruled their lives, right? And I would say, Q, because I thought, you know, you're in a red light area, you're seeing nudity, you're seeing all kinds of things. They would say, nahi. So I realized they hate their bodies. And one of the best ways to help them recover who they are is love for the body. And luckily for me, I found these karate and kung fu teachers because they, once they began to practice kung fu with them, they learned that their bodies are worth something, you know, and their shoulders began to open up, they began to stand straight, they could feel the ground, you know, because they had never even paid attention to their body. It was almost like alienation, a sense of alienation from the body, which then leads to trauma, right? And uh, this happens to most prostituted women. So uh, they go through what we call an out-of-body experience. You know, when they are on a bed and the customers on top of them, they dream of China, they look at the ceiling fan, etc. And so this, because they don't want to be there, it's just their body which is there. So I had to find a way for them to reconnect with their bodies. And, you know, it was all intuitive what I was doing. But obviously the story that I've strung together, it has some challenges, but it's also a, a story which is like a fast paced adventure story, you know, it's a page turner, it's a true crime story. And uh, the way I have done it is, uh, there's a fight in almost every chapter in which Hira is pushing some boundary and trying to win, she wins some, loses some. And... Uh, her body is part of it. So I found it. Oh, you, you found want it. To read it? Oh, sure, of course. No, so, I mean, just maybe from here. I take instructions. And where should I? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I take a mental note. The instructions begin. Left, right, press your thighs, back straight, shoulder down, breathe deeply. As I relax down into what I think is the horse stand, Rinidhi comes and straightens my back. Don't push your chest inward. Rinidhi shows me. All power in Kung Fu comes from the ground. I try to feel the pull of the earth. I embrace gravity, letting it connect with my body. Somehow it's more natural than I could have ever imagined. Something happens. My body loosens up and lets go. I open up my shoulders instead of slouching over my breasts in shame. I inhale deeply into my expanded lungs. I think of when I felt like fighting in the past, how the tension in my body seemed to swallow me. I wasn't in control then, but now I feel as light as air. The gravity centers me. The earth carries me. The day's anxieties don't exist. The earth has absorbed them. I feel as though I can move my body in any direction. We move to the forward stance. Rinidhi shows us how to shift our weight onto the front leg. We bend the front knee, our back leg straight towards the side like a drawn bow. By the time we finish the cat stance, the twist and the crane stance, I'm exhausted. I can feel every muscle ache, every pore breathe. The shame, the guilt and the fear that have been embedded in every cell of my body seem to have seeped out of me. I have always hated my body. 
my breasts and hips, the parts of me that gave me away. They marked me out for the fair in Rabi Dada's eyes. I push my shoulders back and open up my chest without fear. I am calm, though my heartbeat is loud. For the first time, it seems, I notice different parts of my body. <laughs> yeah, so passage. Yeah, no, I would remember thinking about it, and there's another bit which, uh, when the very first time, and she feels, uh, you know, she she sort of details what's happening, how she's sensing her blood flowing in a certain way, and she's feeling her muscle. So I was really curious as to whether you've ever done kung fu. I haven't, but I used to love that movie, Enter the Dragon. <laughs> and I used to wear this black t-shirt with a skull on it. And, you know, I would go around singing, everybody loves kung fu fighting. <laughs> and those kids were as fast as lightning. You know, it was quite something. It was a cult movie in its day. And yeah. Bruce Lee was a cult uh, figure. And, uh, you know, he was fighting for the underdog and all of that. And he would talk about centering your chi. So how you have to fight the power within, but you also have to have the power of your body and the two have to combine. And uh, there's a sentence I use a lot in my book, which says, be like water, flow, mm -hmm. don't crash. That's very important for all of us because we come across so many challenges and sometimes, you know, we are ready to we feel drained or we can't take it on and all. But you have to be like water, you know, you have to flow, not crash. And uh, I thought this is what young people need to hear because this helped me in my youth. And I wasn't an athlete, but I was, you know, I used to do things with my body, like, you know, sometimes try this or that, dancing and uh, yoga and anything that I could, you know, running, uh, try different experiments. And each thing was like, I used to wonder why... Um, me and my school friends hugging. So as soon as I learned a little bit about feminism, I began to sit straighter. I began to walk straighter. I began to throw my voice. I stopped saying, oh, I'm sorry, when I began a sentence. Or I'm not sure, you know, it's not me. It is me. I own what I say. I own my body. You know, so all these things you learn as you take a stand, sometimes that teaches you. And sometimes what you are makes you take a stand. So it's all circular. Yeah. So I think, um, thank you, I think we've, we've talked about a lot of things in the book, but there's uh, so many more ideas that she slips in, which I find very interesting. Like one, there's one little part where, did, where this little girl who has never known anything outside her, her little pada and the school is being exposed to, to books that talk about things in the world, daffodils, mm -hmm. words, words, daffodils. And she thinks to herself, that yes, that's like the way I feel when I see the Sarsuka cave, you know, and they're dancing in the breeze. And then she says, it's very strange, our life, it's so different, the two worlds, yet certain things connect us. You know, people, we feel the same way when we see things. So little insights like that. And then she's able to, which actually show, which actually is speaking to a much bigger uh, uh, concept, which is the concept of the fact that you, you're not look, limited Hmm. Just because you're in one particular very, very isolated or insular space, that your mind is actually able to make these global connections or it, if you're allowed that opportunity. If no one had ever given her that book to read or that poem to study, she would never have, you know, thought of that. So it's lot, this book is sort of um, studied with these little insights, you know, which are very, very, in some ways, very tender. Yeah, and you know, it's there's human. a lot of tenderness and, and empathy in it. I think we will rest here, and, and that's the influence of Bengal humanism. Yeah, I think yeah, so. very much. You know, that style of understanding humanity. Right? Yeah, what you said about the go and transformations yeah. at every Thank point. You've you noticed it. I'm sure you have. Uh, I've seen the problem in two places: Alukamashi's Women's Coordinating Council mm -hmm. and uh, All Bengal Women's Union. Rescued girls, some of them don't want to be rescued after a while. They want to go back because even though they've been abused, treated badly, they've got used to a certain lifestyle of expensive gifts, good soap, etc. It's as flimsy as that. Have you felt the problem? How have you tackled it? That's one. And the second thing is about mothers. You talked about generational. And that, to me, is the saddest thing, that a woman who's been through it, would want a child to go through it. 
So how do you tackle that? Are there special educational programs, counseling programs? What do you do? But uh, one thing is that I've never met someone who wants to go back if she really has a choice. Uh, so it depends on what the choice sure. is. If you're going back to the same starvation and the same um, lack of choices, you know, you wonder you're going to be a burden on the family when you mm -hmm. come back because not only is the family still hungry, but you are disease ridden from all the intimate yeah. body contact with, you know, repeated men for years, right? Plus you become dependent on drugs and alcohol. And plus, uh, you know, the trauma of repeated what I call body invasion, mm -hmm. that uh, leads to anger and depression and mood swings. So, you know, you can't adjust to being in that family again and neither will the family understand you. Yeah. So it's a dignified way of saying I can't be with my family again because the reality is that life in a brothel is not making you richer, it's making you poorer. You earn the most on your first day in the job. Huh. And as your body gets consumed, customers want what they call naya man. So the shelf life of a prostituted woman is just three to five years. Mm -hmm. And after that, she's so disease-ridden and haggard and uh, dependent on uh, drugs and alcohol, etc. that she can't, she doesn't attract customers. And so you really earn less. There are no gifts, etc. It's a small room with a tiny bed, children playing on the floor and muscle men and... Uh, standing outside and if you don't get a customer then you're beaten up or not given food so there's no beautiful life out there what is out there is disease and death so um, basically uh, there's no going back to anything mm -hmm. either in any case you'll probably just go back to the sidewalk and die mm -hmm. just that's the answer to the first question uh, the second question was uh, what was the yeah mother's generation yeah so uh, the mothers are uh, fighting for their daughters if they can. That's what I've noticed. In fact, my own journey began because of mothers. I was, uh, you know, as I mentioned to you, I was traveling through the hills of Nepal and I was a journalist at that time. I stumbled upon villages with missing girls mm -hmm. and followed the train and found little girls locked up in tiny rooms in Mumbai for years. And so I decided to tell the story through a documentary, The Selling of Innocence, and I won an Emmy for it. But when I was on stage and looking at the bright lights, all I could see were the eyes of the mothers. They had told me their story because they said, save our daughters, we want a different future for our daughters. And that's when I decided that I will use my Emmy and my uh, movie not to build a career in journalism, but to make a difference. And that's when I stepped off the stage and my journey began, really. So... Um, you know, and I went back to the brothels with my award and I said, I've told your story, you broke the silence, here's the award, you know, feeling very good about myself. And the women said, no, no, you've got to do more. And I said, what? And they said, you have to help, I, I, you have to help us. And I said, but I'm not a doctor or a lawyer or a social worker. So they, then they said that that's true, but you have access to English and money. Mm -hmm. So I said, sure, and I'll bring that to the table if you also do something. Um, that is to make sure that you stand by your daughters. And that's how we called the organization Apnea. And uh, the first thing we did was rent a school, rent a room in a school, hire a teacher and begin educating the kids. And uh, the mothers had four dreams, school for our children, a room of our own where we can sleep properly, no one will walk in, our children will be safe. safe. A job in an office, which basically meant old age pension, no beatings or violence, fixed monthly income, you know, all that, and punishment of the perpetrators. Mm. Those who had broken away their dreams. Mm. That became up the arms business plan. So, this is how we found answers and solutions from the people who were affected by the problem. And my big learning as an activist has been that uh, solutions come by the people who are affected by the problem, not from the top. And change begins from the bottom and transforms the top. It's like a tree. And if you want people to listen to you, you have to listen to people. And that we are linked and not dragged. So these were things I just learned and I want people to learn, which is why I wrote this book as a crossover book, you know, for kids, for adults, for 80-year-olds, for 14-year-olds. I've written it in simple language. I've written it in any fast pace, like a crime story. So, you know, I, I call this genre social justice adventure. 
because I want people to read it, enjoy it, and get lessons without it being preachy. You know, the, I, yeah. as Anju was saying, I've made it textured, I've made it visual, I have kidnapping and criminals and uh, cross-country flights and break-ins to brothels and kung fu championships. So, you know, I've done all that. And each incident I've drawn from true life. So when someone reads it, they will find the authenticity, but they will also find the adventure. That's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. They did Mahashri Dali. And Mahashri Dali is the person who's written so extensively about uh, denotified criminal trials. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. And she writes about poverty, homelessness, and the starkness of this multiple oppressions on somebody and how it dehumanizes them, humanizes them. And I had access to Mahashri Dali through Ancho and uh, Gayatri. So, you know, uh, I used to go and meet her sometimes and she would say, Ki mela karo, you know, literacy is the best way out. And, you know, over the years, I used to think, these are very simple things, Mahashita, that he's saying, why doesn't she give me more ideas? But those are the ones which have stood the test of time. I just want to ask you uh, about this theme of body autonomy, which you have in the book. Uh, there is something called, uh, you know, Paap and Puno or like, uh, you know, uh, sin, uh, yeah, yeah. the concept of sin associated with the body. And uh, there is also this, uh, I mean, it's not only with prostitutes, even with, uh, I mean, so-called ordinary, normal uh, women, uh, because uh, there's this uh, dichotomy between mind and body and where we always uh, sort of think of the mind as something superior to the body. So uh, when you were uh, dealing, with, when you deal with these women, uh, does this concept of, uh, I mean, uh, you know, sin, and uh, is this uh, is this something prevalent there also, or they just they are just ashamed of their body because it's something which leads to prostitution? Uh, no, no, no. You have, to... and uh, they do think uh, that uh, they are the ones who are committing the sin not the buyers, right? Mm. And so therefore they are to blame and therefore they must have done something in some other life because of which they are being punished for born into this thing. So there's, which is why they believe in the inescapable thing that this is what will happen to us. And to make them think differently is the hardest challenge that no, you are not born to be sold into prostitution. Your body does not belong to you. You are the master of your fate. Imagine something which is as deep rooted, which has gone on in your community for a hundred years. Every message is coming. There are even rituals created around it, right? Marriage to a tree, etc. So the sin is at so many levels. One is the sin of the body, right? The sin of breaking a taboo. The sin of wanting to do something else. You know, the guilt is at every step of the way. So you have to break free of that guilt. And uh, one of the ways we found was this. We didn't know we would succeed. Everything was an experiment that we did. But because we lived in the community, we could hang in there. But the conversation at the bottom of our trenching conversation and what all you do is amazing. It's actually amazing. I... We are really blessed to have you, uh, Ms. Gupta, here to do this conversation, to know about you, know about Apnea, and know about the work that you do. And of course, everybody would love reading the book. On behalf of the foundation, I would like to uh, express my sincere gratitude to you and Anjumji for beautifully ushering the talk in your own unique way. I would like to thank our distinguished associate, Taj Bengal, and media partner, Mike Kolkata. A big thank you to Shri Siv, our patron, Sri Sivant Limited, for their patronage. Last but not the least, of course, the audience for your, you know, for being here and listening to uh, Richard Alji. The foundation, as you know, the foundation promotes cross-state cultural understanding and appreciation. A mosaic of cultures forms the backbone of our nation, contributing to its vibrancy and richness. This is to support our ongoing efforts to foster unity and appreciation of the rich cultural heritage across India's diverse states through mementos, food, music, and art. 
With this context, we are pleased to present the author with one such giveaway tokra on behalf of the team. May I request Amrita Ray to come and felicitate the author and the conversation. Ms. Amrita, please. And I go there to get this piece only because this is this is the woman you know lying with the book. We'll give it to your crafts council. Yeah. Which is I want this piece only for yeah, this Thank you. She said you really keep turning the pages, and it's full of hope. Yeah. It's full of grit and courage mm -hmm. and hope and love. Mm -hmm. Great. The amount of love there is in that between the mother and the daughter and the friends. And, uh, you know, it's true. There's a lot of love. Oh. And it's a true crime story. So all of you who love true crime, you like that. Because <laughs> I love true crime. And if anyone wants to join the movement to end sex trafficking, go to my website, prachiragupta.com. I have a freedom pledge there. So if you scroll down, sign the pledge and join the movement and get the book and share it with someone you know, it might yeah. just save a life. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.